Morning guys, ready for a biggin? I'm addressing this because there seems to be a lot of confusion about who the potential Babylon of Revelation could possibly be. And unfortunately, if you get this wrong, you're not gonna be able to see Antichrist because the Antichrist is identified a few different times in the Old Testament as being from Babylon. In fact, he's called the King of Babylon. Um, obviously we don't have kings here in the States, but if any of you have been following my videos, you know I already firmly believe the United States is the only country that could technically qualify for the end times Babylon, unless the world scene changes massively in the next few short years, which I, I seriously doubt. Um, there's some key elements that make up the, the, just the, the description of Babylon. Obviously, there's the original Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, who put the uh, Israelites by God's power into uh, the 70 year, um, basically, jail sentence for all of their evil, the, uh, the Babylonian captivity that, we're, that you're likely aware of. Um, being that that was the first Babylon, there were a few different notable characteristics about it. Um, obviously, major world war power. I mean, it, it, it dominated the entire Middle East and, and the known world at the time. Um, its economic power was unrivaled. Its, its religious um, effect on the world at the time was unrivaled. Clearly, the, the, the Judean people at the time were upbraided for following Chaldean gods, which were Babylonian gods. Um, you know, economic power... That, that, that spanned, I mean, look at the language that the, the Israelites were speaking when Christ was around. It was mostly Aramaic and Hebrew, which means they still kept the language from the Babylonian captivity. So Babylon had far-reaching effects, even though it had long been destroyed up to that point of, of Christ's tenure here on earth. So uh, today we're going to talk about Antichrist's national origin, Babylon, and the biblical evidence behind it. It is very weighty. I'm going to try my best to keep these short and make them into a series of videos, but well, as you'll see, it's just gonna take a while. Now, I got this information originally, again, from ichthus.com, Dr. Robert Luganbill's website. I read it about nine years ago, and I've been doing everything I can to try and disprove it, because obviously I don't wanna be a part of that country. However, it is what it is, and there doesn't seem to be any avoiding it, and hopefully as, as we follow along, I'll do what I can to notate the scriptures uh, that I'm gonna reference here in the notes, but it's gonna be very heavy. I'll probably upload the video before I can actually get all the information there. Uh, so please bear with me as I try and dig this out. I'm going to be doing some direct reading from the uh, Coming Tribulation series, Part 3a, uh, having specifically to do with Antichrist, his origins, and his uh, methodologies. In this case, again, the origins is what we're going to focus on. So uh, if you were to print out the, uh, the Word file, this is page 25, uh, let's see, through, goodness, through 28. So this is going to be long. So let's start here. Antichrist's national origin. Any attempt to identify Antichrist's country of origin and citizenship as opposed to his genetic ancestry that we've already discussed. Um, tribe of Dan, probably going to claim from Judah just because he's king of liars and Christ was from Judah, so it'll give him some semblance of credibility. Uh, must of necessity first identify prophetic Babylon, for it is Babylon that is the home and the power base from which he ascends to world dominion. So Babylon is the home country of Antichrist. Rather than referring to the historical Babylon of antiquity, Babylon in the New Testament is the symbolic name given by Scripture to the country of Antichrist. See Revelation 17.5, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the world. Also 1 Peter 5.13, She who is Babylon, she who is, in, she who is elect together with you, i.e. the local church in Babylon, in Rome, he was referring to Rome at the time, so he was making a reference to Rome as being the Babylon of his time, greets you. By all accounts, Babylon will be an extremely powerful and indeed the most powerful country in the world, analogous to her dominance in her dominance to Rome in her heyday. Babylon is the nation which Antichrist uses as a power base to leapfrog to control of his new Roman confederacy of Europe, of which Babylon is, tech, is not technically a part. And from there to control the entire world, following the second defeat of the Southern Alliance, his main opposition during the first half of the tribulation. See Daniel 11:25 through 30 in the Hebrew. It is true that prior to the return of the Lord, Antichrist will destroy Babylon, Revelation 17, 16 through 19, 3, but that the beast is from Babylon and arises to world dominance primarily through her influence and power is not changed by the fact that she is later destroyed at his hand and at his command. Indeed, this is precisely what Isaiah prophesied. He's talking about the seventh uh, trumpet right before the Lord returns. So I'm going to keep going. Uh, let's see, this next set of uh, verses will be Isaiah 14, 3 through 20. This is his translation, um, but it's, it's excellent, as you'll see. So, verse 3, And it will come to pass on that day, i.e., during the millennia, when the Lord gives you rest from your pain, during the millennium, when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and from your turmoil and from your hard work 
your hard labor which has been levied upon you, that you will take up this taunt concerning the king of Babylon, in other words, in this case, Antichrist. And you will say how the oppressor, Antichrist, has come to an end, how the golden city, Babylon, has ceased to be. The Lord has shattered the staff of evildoers, the rod of those who ruled over us, which smote the peoples in her arrogance with unrelenting scourging, which ruled the nations in her anger with unrelenting persecution. The whole world is now at rest at peace. They break forth into song. Even the fir trees rejoice over you, the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon, Since you have been laid low, no one comes to cut us down. Sheol below is astir because of you at the prospect of your arrival. It rouses, for the, it rouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the former princes of the earth. It makes all the former kings of the earth rise from their thrones. All of them will answer to you and say to you, even you too have now become weak like us. All your pride has been brought down to the grave, Sheol. All that noise of your harps below, your maggots are spread out like a bed, and your worms are your bed covers. How you have fallen from the heavens, O morning star, O son of the dawn. Also a reference, a dual reference to Satan. So it shows the likeness in the Old Testament and the New Testament how Antichrist and Satan act as one, essentially. Um, For you said in your heart, I will ascend heavenward. I will set my throne above the stars of God, and I will take my seat on the Mount of Assembly on the sides of the north. This is also a reference to his arrogant uh, assumption of godhood during the middle of the tribulation, right as the great tribulation commences. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the God most high, but indeed you will be brought down to Sheol, to the sides of the pit, to those, those who look upon you will contemplate you. They will consider you. Is this the man who confounded the earth, who shook the foundations of the nations? He made the world like a desert and trampled its cities underfoot. He did not let the prisoners go home. All the kings of the earth, all of them, lie in dignity, each in his own tomb. But you have been cast out of your grave like an abominable branch. In contrast to the branch, Christ. So right there, it's showing that he is the anti-branch. Clothed with your slain victims, those pierced by the sword, those who go down to the stones of the pit like a corpse trampled underfoot. You will not share with them in burial, for you have destroyed your own land, you have killed your own people. The seed of evildoers will not be called to remembrance again forevermore. So you can see there's a whole bunch of references in there that actually fit the direct description of Antichrist that comes from Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, so on. They all talk about the same character, the same king of Babylon. That was just one of the best verses out there. I'm going to keep going. And this is the doctor's writing. The introduction to this taunt clearly identifies the king of Babylon as the subject, verse 4, and the future day of restoration as the time for its appropriate use, verse 3. Further, the description of the ruler of Babylon as contained within these verses cannot find their complete fulfillment in any such historical ruler. The king portrayed here was a ruler of a golden city which oppressed Israel, and which, verse 4, and which ruled harshly over all the nations of the earth, verses 5 through 8. The king's aspiration and dark deeds were so exceptional, in other words, he laid the nations low, that all the prior rulers of the earth are anxious for his entrance into the grave Sheol below, verses 9 through 11. He is described as falling from the greatest of heights, from heaven itself, as if he were the morning star, as if he were Jesus, again, over and over again. And we have already seen how much, how much that the true morning star is our Lord Jesus Christ, so that anyone else assuming such a title is by definition a fraud, an antichrist. The ruler in these verses aspired to the highest heights to rule beyond any prior earthly rule, to be like God Most High, verses 13 and 14, to lay, to lay claim, in a word, to all messianic honor, privilege, and power. But in the end, he is the one who is laid low, providing beyond all doubt that he was not the one to come after all, verse 15. This ruler confounded the earth, shook the nations to their very foundations, made the world like a desert, trampled its cities underfoot, but now has himself been humbled. Rather than bring liberation to the captives of the world, as the true Messiah will, he kept them in captivity. And as a result of all of his horrendous deeds, unlike the true branch, Isaiah 4, 2, 11, 1, 53, 2, Jeremiah 23, 5, 33, 15, Zechariah 3, 8, 6, 12, all of those verses reference the branch. This ruler is cast out like a branch that is an abomination. And then see Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14, Daniel 11, 31, 12, 11, Revelation 13, 14 through 15. Revelation uh, chapter 13, 14 and 15, verses 14 and 15. Clearly, these verses have a primary application to Antichrist, the false messiah, and the most germane to our discussion here is the highlighted portion of the last verse quoted. For this passage identifies the individual Antichrist as the king of Babylon, verse 4, and the reproaches of him 
and, the, and reproaches him with one of the most outlandish deeds, namely the destruction of his own country and his own people. Verse 20, and then also see, for example, Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, 8 through 12. Therefore, as we have stated above, the fact that Antichrist does destroy Babylon prior to Armageddon, Revelation 17, 16 through 19, 3, not only does not qualify him as, does not only does not qualify him as king of mystery Babylon, but rather, in accord with Isaiah 14, 3 through 20, positively identifies Babylon as his native land. He is the king of Babylon. He has destroyed his own people in his own country. It's getting better. We also find other prophetic passages which are in line with this identification of Antichrist in Babylon. In Ezekiel chapter 28, Antichrist is also represented as the king of Tyre, verse 12, an alternative representation of mystery Babylon stressing her commercial dominance as exemplified by that premier Phoenician city-state. Note, for example, the closeness in language between the lament for Tyre in Ezekiel and the lament for Babylon in Revelation 18, and then compare Isaiah 23. Like Babylon, Tyre is also pillaged and destroyed by fire in Zechariah chapter 9, 3 through 4. Throughout the book of Jeremiah in particular, we find the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, serving as an antitype for the beast. See in particular Jeremiah chapter 25, 8 through 9, Jeremiah uh, 50 and 51, verses, uh, uh, chapters 50 and 51, and especially 51, 34. Also, for example, Ezekiel chapter 29, 17 through 20. As the king of Shishak, a cryptogram, a cryptogram is a, a, an encoding, if you will, for Mystery Babylon. Antichrist drinks the last of, last of all from the cup of the Lord's wrath, a reference to Armageddon. See Jeremiah 25, 26, Revelation 14, 19. Perhaps most significantly, in Jeremiah 51, 1, we find the Lord stirring up a destroyer against Babylon and the people of Leb Kemeh. Leb Kemeh is a... Well, Lebkeme is also a, crypto, a cryptogram for Babylon, specifically for the people of the Neo-Babylonian Empire who were known to Jeremiah as the Chaldeans. See Jeremiah 51. The NIV is not clear in this, by the way, so if you're reading the NIV, it might not be the best. Now, this cryptogram, when read in Hebrew, yields the meaning, and this is, this is the direct translation of the phrase in Hebrew, the people of those who rise up against me. And this is God making this claim. So he's saying this is, this is an entire nation. But the Masoretic text, which is uh, a, a very awesome all Hebrew um, Old Testament uh, text that we have available, pointing out, pointing of this otherwise unknown phrase need only to be changed in regard to one vowel point in order to read as Leb Kime, Leb Kami, the people of him who rise up against me. Just so we're clear, and you may or may not know this, but ancient Hebrew didn't have any vowels. They actually had to add the vowel points later on for context for readers that were not familiar with the language or that had read the language, um, because Hebrew is a poetically contextual language that um, the, the, the vowels are inferred based upon the context of the entire sentence. Um, so it's, it's, it's very flexible and beautiful and poetically very bang on, very dead on. That is to say, no emendation of the original Hebrew text per se is required to make this verse refer specifically to Antichrist. So in other words, an original Hebrew reader would have seen both the people of them who rise against me and the people of him who rise against me, directly addressing the potential that this is, not the potential, directly addressing that this is Antichrist and his people who rise against him. Only a minor alteration of the 8th century AD interpretation of the Masoretic scholars who, point to the, who pointed to the text. In this context of divine judgment upon Babylon, the first rendering, people of those who rise up against me, makes little discernible sense, whereas the shift to the singular to identify the ruler of Babylon is something paralleled in all of the passages we have seen where Babylon's fate is predicted. In other words, she is always mentioned in concert with her ruler, although he is never said to be destroyed along with her. Jeremiah 51.12, for example. Identification of the king of Babylon as the one who preeminently rises up against the Lord is certainly consistent with the I wills of Isaiah 14 quoted above. And with everything we know about Antichrist's unprecedentedly blasphemous conduct, so many verses, Daniel 7, 8, 720, 725, 825, uh, 1136 through 37, and then the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, Revelations chapter 13, 5 through 6, 16, 14, 17, 13 through 14, Revelation 19, 19, so many. Taken together with all these passages given here, the association of Antichrist with Babylon and specifically as her king indicates clearly that mystery Babylon is his country of national origin. Finally, 
As we have pointed out above, Antichrist is also synonymous with Gog, the future invader of Israel treated in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. This Gog is said to be of the land of Magog, a place which, while indeed a nation in its own right, a people of the far north from Israel's geographical perspective, see Genesis 10-2, uh, 1 Chronicles 1-5, you can verify this, is, in this prophetic contest, context, a synonym for Mystery Babylon. This identification of Mystery Babylon with Magog is clear not only from the unique eschat eschatological details given in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, necessarily future in their application, as it, it is clear even to the casual reader, but also from the commanding role that Magog and her ruler, Gog, are given in that context. That is to say, Gog is chief prince of the two major nations whose role in the invasion is paramount, namely Meshech and Tubal. And Magog is not even mentioned when Gog's rulership of these two primary nations is repeated in Ezekiel 39, 11, 39 1. So it's saying that uh, Meshech and Tubal basically make up revived Rome. He's originally from Gog. He's the, he's the, the Gog of Magog, but he's, he's not even mentioned as ruling over them towards the end of his, uh, his stead. Many other significant nations are included in this confederacy in a subordinate way. In other words, Persia, Put, Cush, Gomer, Beth, Togarma, see Ezekiel 38, 5 through 6, and to a lesser extent, Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish, Tarshish, uh, that's Spain, uh, Ezekiel 38, 13. While still other unnamed nations participated as well, Ezekiel 38, 6 b second half of the verse. <clears throat> Thus, Gog's home nation, Magog, represents a sort of supernation from which Gog rules and directs this coalition of, world, of a worldwide scope, a situation perfectly analogous to Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. Given all this, the fact that the word Magog is also potentially a cryptogram, a cryptogram for Babylon is doubtless both significant and deliberate. For this is a phenomenon well attested for use specifically with Mystery Babylon in the book of Jeremiah, as we have seen above. The name Gog will then be a back formation from Magog, which can bear the meaning place of Gog, whose function is to identify this future ruler, Antichrist, intimately with Magog, Mystery Babylon. I'm going to finish this one here because this has already gone on very long, but I think, I think it's abs I, I have not been able over the last nine years to tear this apart. I have read many people's versions of things are saying, oh, it'll be so many different options it'll say it's rome that's that's babylon they'll say it's it's uh it's it's somewhere in the middle east or or the original location of babylon iran iraq and so on but none of those places have the material dominance that the the babylon that is to come has and i mean i'm sorry but i turn on the tv and i don't see people wearing anything other than nikes baseball caps t-shirts and blue jeans that came from us and places where our language was as far reaching as possible i mean i talked to brothers in africa who speak our language and they would prefer to speak our language because they know that that's the language of commerce. So anyhow, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut that off here. We're going to talk about Babylon as being a definite geographical place in the next video so that you guys can see how this all goes together. Um, and we'll go on from here. Bless you guys. I hope you're having a good day. Please leave your comments below. Subscribe if you like. Share this because part two is it's going to get you know more and more in depth. And um, I'm going to do everything I can to honor this because... We need to understand that there, there's a reason why there's a reason why everything is happening in our country as is. We are the place where his religious nonsense kicks off and poisons the entire world, and eventually, uh, we are destroyed as a result. Um, but not till the very end of the tribulation. So a lot of the fear mongering and nonsense that's out there is unfounded, at least in a biblical perspective. Talk to you soon, guys.